Tonight we're going to talk about uh, beyond visual range radar fundamentals, and uh, let's just. I'm just going to cover like the kind of the scope and the depth of this brief. So this lecture is really intended to just kind of supplement um, or be a review for a, a lot of the people here tonight, probably of the APG 73 air-to-air -air radar. We kind of the scope of BVR and you know really within DCS. We're going to cover some real world stuff, but um, mostly it's going to be kind of limited to the scope of DCS. So, you know, we'll go through like some general radar concepts with an emphasis on pulse Doppler radars. Um, we'll cover a little bit of the air to air radar modes, um, except for velocity search, because that's not implemented yet. Uh, we'll go over some radar centric avionics format pages that are likely just going to be review. And we'll go over some of the weapons with an emphasis on fire control radar support. And kind of the depth of this presentation is that it's going to be at a high level, um, really a, you know, like searching for like a qualitative understanding to kind of hopefully maximize your usage in the sim. So with that being said, we'll just jump right into basic radar concepts. So first, we'll talk about the basic principles of radar measurement. So Radar, if you're not familiar, uh, stands for radio detection and ranging. Uh, typically, radar is kind of, they can see in three dimensions at least, uh, for air-to-air -air radars anyway. So a lot of surface radars are two-dimensional, but let's simplify everything. Um, it's three-dimensional radars report out target position, generally in spherical reference frame that consists of slant range, uh, bearing and elevation, and you can see kind of the dimensions here on this chart on the left, um, slant range, and then uh, elevation, angle, and bearing. So that those are like the three primary uh, measurements for like a pulse radar. Uh, that is possible because range measurements, uh, or excuse me, electromagnetic waves have some uh, three basic properties. Uh, so generally, the waves are, can be reflected if they meet an electrical leading surface. Uh, so when you send out a pulse, it'll be reflected back to you. EM waves travel at the speed of light, so it's a constant speed that's uh, known. And EM waves normally travel through space in a straight line. So I say normally because that doesn't account for ducting or multipath or any kind of refraction or anything like that. But you know, in the sim, it's all spherical chickens in a vacuum, right? So you know, we can we can just say normally. You know, that's we don't have to worry about any of that craziness. Uh, so the range is pretty easy to determine. Really, you just send out a pulse and you wait for it to return. And it's really based on you know because the speed's constant. It's based on the time that it takes. And you kind of see in like the range measurement a uh, little graphic down here, like how that's actually calculated. Um, the angular determination of a target is really in the you know for the scope of this presentation. It's going to be based on where the antenna's pointed. Um, there's actually a lot more going on there, but uh, you know, just for the scope of the sim world, like we'll just say that that's how it's actually, you know, like measured. Pulse Doppler radars uh, actually measure the Doppler effect, and it can help you actually separate airborne targets from the background clutter. You know, if, if this radar was actually looking down at a target and there was a bunch of like buildings and stuff in the way, each one of those you know, reflections down there, like the building, maybe an airplane, all that stuff could have, uh, you know, close measurements and bearing and range and all that stuff. But Doppler, you can actually separate out moving targets from non-moving targets. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so actually right now, so like the Doppler effect is a shift in frequency of a wave radiated, reflected, or received by an object in motion. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard like a you know fire truck coming down the street and as it's approaching you the sound that you hear is a higher pitch and as it passes you and starts to move away from you the pitch starts to get longer and longer and longer so it's you know it's it's like a, you can hear a sound difference the same thing happens with em waves um we've got these graphics right here so basically the green wave on this chart can you guys see my mouse no, no, I don't think right. so. You should you guys be able know to, how to... Uh, on, ahead, the, on the bottom left, there should be a, a laser pointer uh, if you move the mouse towards the bottom of the presentation. 
Is this it? Laser pointer. Aha. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, so the green wave is the outbound signal. And so if we had a target approaching us with a higher radial velocity, the reflected signal is actually going to be compressed. And so that's really what I mean by Doppler shift. So that frequency change is the Doppler shift. You can see the same thing in the this uh, graphic on the right here. It's the same for outbound targets. As long as there's a delta in radial velocity, you'll see some type of Doppler shift. And then down here, this graphic really kind of points out, like, so if your Doppler shift is primarily dependent on radial velocity, uh, so the more the higher the magnitude of that radial velocity is, the greater the Doppler shift. So that's kind of the bumper sticker here. Doppler shift is proportional to radial velocity or closure rate. So any questions on that? Okay. So moving on to the next slide. Okay, so how does this actually work in pulse Doppler radar? So pulse Doppler radars leverage that Doppler shift uh, while retaining kind of like that all aspect uh, detection capability. So you can still see in range for the most part, there's some caveats there, uh, bearing, elevation, and now Doppler. So the PD radar transmits these short pulses of energy and listens for that Doppler shift in their return. So that the pulse, the number of pulses that you send out over any time period is the pulse repetition frequency. And that can actually be controlled by the, the operator, and we'll get into that later. But the, um, the PD radar uses Doppler shift for target detection and elimination of ground targets, like I said before. So that's kind of what's responsible for that whole look down, shoot down capability of the APG-73 radar and most Gen 4, uh, Gen 5 radars. So it does come with some limitations, um, as I'm sure a lot of people are actually aware. Uh, basically, PD radars will only see targets that generate a Doppler shift. That's actually not true all the time. There are some limited cases in real life where the statement that they won't see it isn't true. You can actually still see things depending on your PRF mode and range uh, and bearing space, um, but not always. Uh, so generally, you're kind of limited to only getting like solid solid tracking information from targets that are actually generating Doppler. So any target that's flying perpendicular or tangential to the antenna will basically result in a frequency shift equal to the ground return. And um, all of these radars have basically what's called a clutter notch. So if, if a target return doesn't have enough Doppler shift on it, they will just notch it out or not report it. And that's so you don't report out like ground, non-moving targets. So going to the next slide. So now we're going to kind of shift gear and talk about radar scan uh, volume. So scan volume is uh, really uh, made up of three things. It's your azimuth scan settings. So you know, in our radar, it goes out to 70 degrees, uh, all the way down to 10 degrees. Um, and you can search an elevation with bar scans. So basically, uh, one bar is one sweep uh, across the azimuth. Uh, so however wide that um, beam is, you'll search one beam width, and then two bars, and three bars, and or excuse me, four bars, and then six bars. So if you combine those two things, you really get, uh, combine those two things with a max range, you get um, this search volume. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is that increasing the, the search volume it potentially increases your SA because, you, hey, you can scan more of the sky. But it also increases the frame search time, which will reduce your track file update frequency. And that'll be important later when we start talking about missile guidance and stuff like that. Because in order to properly guide a missile, you need an adequate track file update frequency. And if you're scanning a huge swath of the sky, it's going to you know, the time between updates is actually going to increase and may actually degrade some uh, guidance for command inertial uh, active weapons like the AIM-120. So the, the real thing to understand here is that just search volume and update frequency are inversely proportional. Uh, so, but it's not a problem most of the time because, well, I, oh, sorry, before I get into that, um, yeah, so this is just kind of what you're seeing, you know, what you can see actually on the displays for your uh, current scan volumes. So on the left, we have the ASL 
format screen, you can kind of actually see your like a visual depiction of your radar field of view box here on the left. So this is kind of this the region of the sky that you're looking for in from a C scope or like a you know like an angle space perspective. And then from a B scope perspective, you can see the azimuth of your total scan. Here's your scan, your as setting and the range. Um, so yeah, just I'm sure this is all probably just uh you guys already know about this stuff, but uh, anybody have any questions on this screen? Okay. Yeah, I have a quick question. Go for it. I haven't seen the one on the left. I just saw it recently. Um, I guess, how do you get to that page? So you can get to the... Uh, so if you're in air-to-air -air mode, you uh, all you have to do is actually press left on the sensor select switch, and that'll automatically queue up as i as far as I know, when I was testing this before the brief, I couldn't get to Azel unless I was in air-to-air -air mode. I'm not sure if that's normal or if it's just a bug, um, but you have to be in air-to-air -air mode as of testing like a couple weeks ago. Okay, cool. And <clears throat> so you're saying like even if you use the the OSB buttons, it still wouldn't let you in there? It wouldn't let me in when I tested it, like uh, yeah, about two weeks ago. It was kind of strange, but I took I put the uh system into air to air mode and it would let me in every time either through the osbs or through sensor select uh you know like whatever direction the radar is not on so if the radar is on well no i think it's don't quote me on that i i did it towards the left and i'm not sure if it works vice versa but generally your radar attack page comes up on the right uh so if you want it up right away you can just press left but it's actually really handy to actually be able to visualize kind of in bearing, you know, an angle space, like what your field of view is. It's helped me out a couple of times, you know, like generally I'll use the radar cursor. Like I put it uh, to the right of these two targets just to get an idea of my altitude restriction. So I think I'm in a two bar search right here at a 60 as scan. It's a pretty decent update rate. Um, and I'm in RWS mode. So. You know, without this page, you can't really tell like how high an elevation you are. But you know, if you put your TDC next to the targets, you can get a general idea of what your altitude restrictions are. And these guys are at twenty-four thousand feet, so they're right smack in the middle of my little window here. Um, right, and if you change your elevation, it updates on both left and right screens, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. So, what does the like the symbology in green, the circle, and the lines below the targets. Oh, yeah, we'll get into that. In a, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So we're actually going to get into that in a little bit. But um, generally, this is uh, this is the allowable steering uh, error, uh, the circle. This is the steering dot. So basically, you want to put the thing in the thing. Um, you know, this is, you know, basically, so if your head's down and you're trying to determine whether you can actually fire that missile off at an appropriate uh, angle off. If the dot is inside the large circle, it's okay. It's okay. Ideally, you want to put it in the middle, um, but this is just really for energy conservation. And then these uh, lines right here are your max uh, range and stuff like that. We'll go over to that in a little bit, but uh, yeah. I never really used ASL before I started studying for this brief, and now I love it. Because uh, I can kind of visualize my scan volume really well. Yeah, it, it helps me out a ton. Like in in a situation where you've got contacts from a donor aircraft or the uh, AWACS on your radar screen, but you can't get them locked up. Like a lot of times, you'll pop over to the screen on the left, and that red circle will be above your yellow bar. Yep. And then you'll know you just have to increase your your scan, either the bars or or physically move the scan range up, and then magically they pop into where you can lock them. Yep. It's uh, I, I'm surprised I I just I wish I actually looked into it before because when we ever did the one when, when we did BVR training before I don't know if it was available but it would have been really helpful. Yeah, it's relatively new. I think it was like maybe a couple months ago is when that update came out. Yeah, I believe it. So this this uh, we'll go over this a little bit later, but both of these screens show MSI tracks, so you know you get the Hafu symbology and everything like that. So. All right, so I just wanted to point out that I get everything you're saying because I have to deal with radar daily, but put the thing in the thing is the only marine-friendly thing you've said this entire brief. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. 
it's a you know it's a simple concepts it's perfect <laughs> so uh we were talking about update rate and search volume kind of like the trade-off there and one of the things that you can do to kind of um still maintain situational awareness while uh still getting an update a, a decent update rate is melding your search volume with another friendly aircraft so we always kind of strive to work in pairs when it comes to searching out like large volumes of area. So one of the ways that we can actually do that is, you know, you can come up with a lot of different conventions, but uh, one of the the methods that we've taught before is high uh, nose high, nose low, which basically says that, you know, one, one aircraft, uh, excuse me, both aircrafts will set a radar, you know, uh, bar setting of like four to six, uh, set your range to about 80 nautical miles, Slow your TDC to about uh, 25 nautical miles. And then the first aircraft will scan the low altitude. So they'll set their uh, altitude range to basically sea level and up. So whatever you can get up. And then the second aircraft will set their uh, TDC to, you know, 4,000 and down, or excuse me, 40,000 and down. So this kind of melded search volume allows you to maintain. Uh, you know, basically your update rate while scanning like a larger battle space, uh, really handy. So generally, I think when we talk about um, melding and stuff like that, we you know, melding search patterns and uh, committing and all that kind of stuff. When we actually get into the the timeline of engagement, this will come back up. Uh, so the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about pulse repetition frequency because uh, this is kind of a gotcha depending on target aspect. So pulse repetition frequency. It really just refers to the number of pulses transmitted per second. Uh, so on the on the left here, on the graph on the left here, um, each one of these pulses, these large rectangles, that's when the actual radar is like sending out or broadcasting and then waiting for a return. And then you can kind of see the echo signal, like that's the actual return. So there's this receiving time and a little bit of dead time where the radar is kind of doing whatever control pulses is. I'm not quite sure. but. Uh, and then it sends out another pulse. And in reality, it does this like thousands of times, you know, for an entire search volume, or excuse me, for in, like a particular search frame. It happens super fast. Uh, but the the time in between these pulses is your pulse repetition frequency. And so we have actually a couple of uh, a couple of different modes. So. In, with our radar, we have what's like called a high PRF mode and a medium PRF mode, and then we have interleaved. And I'll go through kind of the differences of each and some of the capabilities and limitations. So starting with high, you're going to get a better detection of range and the Doppler effect because you're technically sending out more data. You're sending out, you're getting more returns. So you have more data to process. You can actually get more information about individual contacts. The high pulse rate can lead to range ambiguity. So basically, if you use your imagination, we're moving this uh, second transmit pulse to the left. So it's giving us less time to actually listen for a signal. So when I say range ambiguity, it's basically because you don't have enough, you potentially don't have enough time to actually listen for this, the return signal sometimes. So you may get some ambiguity in range because that that actual return could be over here on the right after the second transmitted pulse. Uh, but this, uh, so primarily though, uh, you're filtering in Doppler, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but because you're filtering primarily in Doppler, you're more susceptible to notching. So if you ever have lost a target due to notching and you're in high PRF, that's likely why uh, it's primarily filtering in Doppler, so we just won't see anything that's not uh, giving you a Doppler shift. Medium PRF is actually what all of the air combat modes uh, set by default. So if you go into air combat maneuvering, any of those settings, uh, bore sight, wide ac, uh, the gun search uh, mode, uh, and vertical acquisition, they all use medium PRF because that shorter detection range, it, it's shorter in detection range, but it actually can see uh, almost all aspect targets a lot better by filtering both in range and in Doppler, typically in that order too. 
Uh, so medium PRF is great, but you can't see targets really far away. Um, but by default, the plane will set this interleaved pattern. So what interleave does is basically cycles between medium PRF and high PRF for every single elevation bar. So if bar one is on medium, bar two will be on high. And those uh, search cones actually intersect quite a bit. So they're like, uh, basically, what ends up happening is you end up scanning the entire volume in both modes uh, for the most part. There is because they overlap, but they don't overlap perfectly. So, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, you know, it's great. So depending on kind of what your target's doing and how far it is away, I gave you this table of like, kind of like the ideal settings, but don't feel like you have to memorize that. Ultimately, what you need, what I think is good to memorize is that you just set PRF, you know, set interleaved to kind of in, ensure that you have a, a decent probability of detection and to reduce your workload. If there's, you know, like if you're in close and they're trying to beam you, you know, it's a great idea to actually set medium PRF. Or if they're really far away and you're having trouble detecting them, try high, you know. Or you can also reduce, if you set interleave, you can reduce your scan volume and get a higher update rate and you might be able to build the track that way. Is there any questions on PRF? Okay. So now we're going to kind of talk about just the radar system in general. And I'm going to go over some of the radar centric uh, pages like Radar Attack and Azanel. And I think most of this stuff is going to probably be review for a lot of you guys, but we'll just quickly go over it. Uh, so the radar attack format, I'm not going to cover everything, um, just a couple of these things, but uh, there's, let's see here. So PRF, uh, we just talked about that. It's a little weird because it's shown as pulse repetition interval on the screen, and I'm not sure why, because technically pulse repetition interval is the inverse of pulse repetition frequency, which would flip everything. Yeah, so that's weird. So. As far as I know, this is actually PRF. I don't know why it's labeled PR PRI, but if you ever see that, that's if you're like, wait, well, I want to change my PRF mode, and you see PRI, it really means PRF. I don't know. I don't know why they said it that way, but this is where it's actually indicated on the bottom of this, on the bottom left hand of the screen is what. So this current setting is in. Uh, we're scanning a medium, but it's actually set and interleaved. Um, another thing that I didn't actually cover in this brief. But it's really good information, and it's a really interesting read. Is this non-cooperative target recognition? Uh, so another advantage of Pulse Doppler Radar is you get that Doppler return, and you can actually analyze the Doppler return, not only just the Doppler, because the Doppler is a change in frequency, but the PD radar can actually analyze phase shifts as well. And so if we like actually broadcast out, you know, if we get a return back from a uh, a uh, airplane, and it hits the engine. You can actually get a phase shift from the spinning uh, compressor blades in the front. And you can analyze that phase shift. And I guess, you know, non cooperative target recognition has like a lookup table and can make uh, estimated, you know, like a, a guess as to what type of airplane that is. So <laughs> that's actually where that comes in. If, I don't know if you guys have ever seen on the SA page. Um, but it'll sometimes tell you the type of the aircraft, and that's likely where that's coming from. But uh, obviously, there's aspect angle dependency there. You have to be looking down their uh, engine nacelles and stuff. But really, sounds kind of uh, similar to the way that a sonar operator on a submarine can tell what kind of uh, vehicle is doing by how many blades it has and how fast they're turning and yada yada yada. Yeah, it's uh, it's. I'm sure it's a lot like that. I actually don't know very much about sonar, um, but it sounds like the same concept. But yeah, other, I mean, other than that, uh, any questions on this? I, I'm sure you guys have seen this before. I just it's in here just as a learning aid, really. Okay. All right. So this is the second page. I can't remember what I was going to say on this. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So I did want to cover this. This is um, all of the different uh, bearing range altitude information on here. There's a ton of it. 
So this confused the crap out of me when I first started learning. So up here on the top left, you have your bearing range altitude of the air to air waypoint to the cursor or the LNS. So wherever you're pointing your cursor, and correct me if I'm wrong, sorry, I actually still have trouble with these. Uh, but yeah, so this is you know basically the bra from the air to air waypoint to your cursor if you have one set, and then this is the actual you know the waypoint. It's uh, actually shown as this little kind of triangle-looking tadpole thing, uh, and then down here below you have the like your own ship to cursor or your launch and steering queue uh, bearing range and altitude. This is primarily what I use, but uh, uh, some people like to use air to air waypoints. I'm st I still have trouble with them, but uh, down here at the bottom you have your air to air waypoint to own ship, so the distance from you know, like where your actual plane is at to your air to air way or air to air waypoint. Um, so just, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in, I'll jump in here real quick for Hita. So cool. the the air to air waypoint is typically what we set. We call it bullseye. So the cool thing about this is no matter where, like it, you know, obviously when you're just pointing your cursor, it, it doesn't really matter. But once you lock up a target, then it's going to give you that target's um, bra to that to bullseye so no matter where the jet is in space so if you know if we've got another flight that's 20 miles away you you can give them that number and if they lock up a target that's got that exact same number then you guys know you're locking up the same target so it's really a way to reference the position of of an aircraft um just kind of in general terms and not necessarily you know specific to the jet you're in so if you ever hear, uh, you know, somebody else say, you know, they're engaging a target bulls 299 for 30, then if you lock up a target that says 299 for 30, then you know that's the um, exact same uh, target that they're talking about. Or if an AWACS gives you a, a bullseye call, then uh, it's just kind of a way to to reference that because if 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 not then you would have to know the from your aircraft what the bearing range and altitude was and that's going to be different for every single aircraft so it's basically just a way to communicate the position uh, that that every aircraft can understand as long as they have that bullseye set and for the mission three next week we're actually going, going to uh use that so uh kind of be familiar with that right on yeah you said it way better than i could okay so moving on to the Oh, wait, one last thing. Uh, I did want to mention that. So the acquisition point queue, kind of new. Um, it definitely wasn't there when the Hornet was released, but this basically, this cross represents your highest priority MSI track file. And it will, you know, so if you do auto act, this is actually what you'll acquire first, is this uh, auto or acquisition point queue. So you can kind of visualize what you would actually acquire. I think that's dependent like what actually you know so for ranking as far as acquisition point queue i know it's range dependent so it's usually the closest guy to you i'm not sure if they calculate closest point of approach as far as i can tell i think they do so keep that in mind okay so for as an l uh, this one's kind of new so i will actually well it's kind of new. It's definitely new to me. Uh, so we'll kind of go through some of these. But interrogation mode up here at the top left is not implemented yet, but uh, uh, it looks like it's single. I'm not sure what it's actually going to be in the future. To the right of that is the field of view. So you can actually, if you're using the radar or the TGP, you can actually use, so you can use this uh, screen with the TGP as well uh, for visual identification, but you can toggle on and off this field of view. Uh, the IFF ID filter is kind of cool. So when this, it's not implemented yet, but you will actually be able to filter out friendlies and stuff like that if you only want to see hostile targets. As we kind of talked about before, uh, getting to this screen if you're in air-to-air -air master mode is just sensor select left. Um, your elevation scale, you can actually toggle this. Um, so right now, I think I have 30 set. Um, this goes up. I can't remember exactly what the uh, the settings you know go up to it goes all the way up to i believe 70 um but the hash marks kind of show you like this would be 15 degrees here um your combined interrogator transponder uh can be limited to range so it, right now i've got it set to iff 100 uh, ultimately what that does is it'll ex 
it'll read IFF returns up to 100 miles, but no further. You can actually scale that down if you don't want IFF returns from everybody out to 100 miles. Uh, could just kind of help with your essay because sometimes it just could be really cluttered. Uh, horiz you know, horizontal crosshair is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, declutter is not implemented yet. Uh, reset clears your DT2 and resets your LNS to priority one in TWIS. So that's kind of helpful sometimes. Just don't bump into that if you're in the middle of engagement, though. <laughs> But uh, same thing with RWS, it clears your DT2 and LNS, so both of those things get cleared. Uh, this is your CIT azimuth width right now, where it's at 140, and I just leave it at that. As far as I know, this it, I know in real li in real life it takes uh, radar resources, um, but in my testing, I didn't notice any difference whether you know as far as like uh, response time for IFF if I set this smaller. So I just leave it at 140. Um, Toggle expands the the expanded view, so you can actually like kind of zoom in on stuff. Uh, auto interrogate. This is kind of important. So it auto interrogates uh, every ten seconds if the LNS exists. Uh, then it, well, so if it if an LNS doesn't exist, then basically it auto interrogates every ten seconds. If LNS exists, then it switches to LNS auto interrogation every se ten seconds. So it'll auto interrogate. You know your LNS guy every 10 seconds, so it kind of switches based on what exists at what time. Uh, we talked about the field of view, uh, vertical crosshair. It's pretty self-explanatory. You can go to your stores uh, display, and this is actually TDC enabled, so you can actually hover over it. And then your priority sensor, whether you're using IFF uh, via the radar or flare, you can actually uh, toggle that right here. Any questions on this one? OK. Uh, so now we're, we've kind of seen track files in some of these last slides. Now I'll just talk a little bit about what the multi-source integration or MSI tracks are. So essentially, the multi-source integration tracks are a single airborne target with supporting information, such as kinematics, like your state, your range bearing elevation, range rate, bearing rate, all that stuff. Um, your ID information, whether you're hostile, ambiguous, friendly, or unknown, and your threat ranking. And your threat ranking can actually be seen in these symbols. So your LNS is actually your launch and steering target. That's where your weapons will guide. You have a secondary target, uh, which is DT2. And then everybody else gets ranked 1 through 8. So these are all the next highest priorities. So beyond LNS and DT2, your next highest priority target would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Uh, you have a maximum of 10. Uh, which includes the LNS, DT2, and threat priority 1 through 8. Uh, kind of weird because, uh, well, not weird. It's, I guess it's, uh, it's synced up with the number of missiles you can carry. And as far as I've read, you can actually guide up to 10 missiles, assuming that you can support them all in air, but uh, those two things correlate. Uh, they're presented across, obviously, the radar attack uh, format page, the AS and L, and also the situational awareness. And then as far as launch and steering and the designated, tar uh, designated target two, the onboard radar track files can you know, basically be designated by the pilot uh, for weapon engagement cues. And that's what's really what you're doing. So your primary target is this launch and steering. And then uh, your secondary target would be the DT2. The, uh, but yeah, I think I already said this, but LNS track is, is the uh, primary pilot designated track file used for air to air weapons guidance. Um, when the LNS exists, a secondary track, that's the DT2, can be designated. So you could slew over, like, if you basically to select a DT2, you just slew over the track file you want to designate, and you just depress, TDC depress on that guy. And then if you slew over another track, you can D TDC depress on him and designate him as a secondary target. You can swap them by pressing the nose wheel steering uh, undesignate button. Or if you don't have anything selected as your launch and steering file, you can cycle through them with the nose wheel steering button. I think I covered all the ways. Tex, do you remember any yep. other ways? Okay. Okay. Nope, I think you got it. But just remember that LNS, the one with a star, if you pull the trigger and fire a missile, that's what it's going to. Yep. So if you're firing multiple, multiple missiles, you've got to fire the first one and then do something to get a second um, target designated as the LNS before you fire again. So like 
uh, Fajita was saying, if you have an LNS and a DT2, then you would tr uh, trigger, squeeze one off, hit your undesignate button. That'll switch the two and then squeeze the second one off. And the, do you have HUD symbology on here? Uh, I do, actually. Okay. Uh... So I won't steal your thunder there. But the, the other thing you can do is if you do not designate the DT2, so if you just have an LNS, then that undesignate will just cycle through them all. So if you wanted to shoot more than two at, at a group of targets, you would just, you know, LNS, fire, undesignate, it'll switch to the next highest priority, fire, next highest priority, fire. So you can actually uh, get multiple missiles off it at, like you said, up to 10 different targets by doing that. But the second you designate uh, a DT2, then all that nose wheel steering is going to do is go back and forth between those two targets. Yep. And so all this symbology on your HUD and on your radar attack page will actually change based on the LNS too. So if you notice like the uh, allowable steering error circle is right here and it's based on the, the relationship between the circle and the dot is based on my LNS. So if I were to actually fire on this guy, I need to come left quite a bit, uh, almost 70 degrees to actually put that dot in the middle of the uh, allowable steering error circle. Okay, so the HUD symbology, we'll just get started with that since we're kind of already talking about um, the HUD, you know, about the LNS. But this is uh, basically, I think your LNS shows up as a tri, or excuse me, as a diamond. And based on your IFF data, if you have correlated IFF data from another source, and so if your aircraft is ID to target as hostile, it'll show up as this tri, or excuse me, diamond. And that's if you have onboard information only. If you have onboard information and offboard information that's correlated to your LNS track file, then you'll also have this little caret on top of it. And then if it's unknown or friendly, it comes across the HUD as a square. So the HAFU stands for hostile and one one second here, Fajita. And like one thing, like the ROE sometimes in real life is like. You know, if you don't have the, the correlated data, then you can't fire. So sometimes it may be, you know, if the ROE requires, you know, two people to to IFF it before you can fire, then you would have to wait to get that little uh, carrot to fire. And then the other thing to remember on the HUD is if you have a DT2 designated, then on the HUD, it's going to show an X. Yeah. We so then if you, if you undesignate, it'll go back and forth between the, the X and the square or the diamond. So, uh, so basically, onboard information for hostile, ambiguous, friendly, or unknown is kind of shown uh, on the left here. So your hostile shows up as a chevron, ambiguous as a thick staple, uh, friendly is always a circle, and unknown is just a staple. Uh, and then with each track file, you have some additional information. If you hover over them in RWS, you can actually see some of this. Uh, you get the target altitude on the right, the target speed and mock on the left, the threat ranking uh, and or additional information. So right now, this picture showing the LNS target you can also show DT2 as the, as the diamond or a track rank file. You also have angle only tracks if range is invalid. Uh, you'll see this angle or A for that. If the target's jamming you and uh, typically when they're jamming you, range is not going to be valid. Uh, you'll see this J on the side of it. And then if it's an aging track file, as in you're going to about to lose it, it'll start to fade like that. And then when you start to correlate information, you have all this information up on the top. So the top is your information, and the bottom is actually the donor information. So when you have both of them correlated, you get a full symbol. If you just have donor tracks and you don't actually have any onboard sensor picking this up, You'll just have the bottom information. And if I can't remember, so text might be able to help me out here. So the difference between, oh, okay, it's, it's friendly fighter. So if your friendly fighter, I think, is picking it up, then I believe it's just the bottom. And if the AWACS is seeing it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's going to be this two thirds size hafu down here in the I, bottom. I believe that's correct. Okay. And then your friendly fighter, uh, PPLI, I can't remember, uh, something, precision participant, something or other, uh, is going to be shown as a circle with a dot on the side of it. 
And then any AWACS or uh, command control aircraft, like AWACS, is going to have the dot in the center. So definitely stuff to commit to memory, all these these symbols and what they mean. Is, is there any importance between ambiguous and unknown? E, kind of. So ambiguous means basically that you might have got a friendly return and somebody else got a hostile and so now the two are kind of not so that's for the correlation case i don't really don't know how you get into ambiguous with just your own information unless you got multiple iff returns over time and once they were friendly and the second time they were uh they qualified as hostile and i'm not quite sure how that works in the sim you know like I'm not sure if it's just, hey, you didn't get a response and you assume hostile or wh whatever, but it's either if it's your own information, I speculate that it's just you got conflicting information over time. And if it's correlated, you got somebody that saw them as one thing and another person saw them as a, maybe a hostile. Gotcha. Okay. I, I've honestly never seen one of these in the sim. Not to say that they don't exist, but I've just never seen one. I'd assume that's going to be more of a real life thing to where we're like selling our aircraft to other countries who are using different uh, IFF encryption. So now you can read it. You can see what it is. It could be friendly, but it could be a completely different country as well. So it's going to depend on uh, the the large scale at the same time. So let's go through the, I think you've got radar modes here, and then I believe after that it's the weapon system. So let, let's stop at the weapons, and then we'll uh, jump in and fly. Sounds good. Okay. So the first one we're going to cover is range well scan with latent track well scan. So range well scan uh, with latent track well scan kind of gives you almost the best of both worlds. RWS is great for searching large scan volumes, and it is primarily intended for target surveillance you oh i'm not going to talk about that yet so sorry i was about to get ahead of myself so in latent track so latent track will scan if it's enabled rws will process msi track files so basically what this means is that behind the scenes uh your radar will search for contacts over and over and over again so in rws it's really just showing you raw radar information and if you enable latent track while scan, the radar basically will try to remember the things that it saw from the previous scan and correlate those to the current scan. So if you saw a target at 100 miles, you know, with a bearing of like 30 degrees, or whatever, and then on the next scan, it's going to propagate that information forward. So it'll take its bearing, range, and range rate and propagate all that stuff forward in time as a prediction and it'll basically draw an error bubble around that and say if i see another target within this little error bubble i'm going to try to correlate it and if it does successfully do that you can build track files and that track file is basically just information over time and you can have a max of 10 of those uh, so you know it's it's actually good enough to potentially guide on but because RWS doesn't limit the scan volume to maintain the MSI track files because so there's like a minimum update rate before you're going to drop them. So if you if you have m number of opportunities, but you haven't, you know, so there's an n over m basically equation. So the the number of observations over the number of opportunities, and I don't know what it is in the sim, but if you don't meet that criteria, if you don't see it at least, you know, maybe uh, maybe two out of you know, like six times, I'm just throwing numbers out there, then it'll just drop the drop the track. Um, and you need the MSI track to uh, guide AIM-120s. So it's pretty powerful, but it has its limitations. You can build track files. It's Technically, it's good enough for guidance, assuming that you have the update rate to support it. And then the last thing I would say about range well scan is that you can enter STT by either single target track by either TDC depressing on the LNS or auto acquisition, I think works too. Um, and then that kind of leads us into the single target track. Uh, so this mode, single target track, just slaves the radar antenna and it basically just stares at your designated track. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, in RWS, you're not going to have a, a launch and steering. You can select a raw radar brick to do this. Or, you know, like if you select the LNS, it'll just sit there and stare at the the target. And one of the advantages of doing that is that you're going to have the highest update rate possible. That's the ideal method for guiding air to air weapons because you're going to have an extremely high update rate on that target. So you're going to know basically where that target's at at every opportunity that you had to observe it because you're just constantly streaming out information at it. But it comes at a cost. You will lose all the other targets. You can only see this this single target, so you won't be able to see anybody else uh, from the radar. Anyways, you'll still get the PPLI. Uh, and, you know, other donor track information on your screen, but you just won't be able to see them with your own radar. Uh, so I, I talk a little bit about the acquisition modes here. If you, you manually do it by uh, TDC to press, uh, you can also get into it with AutoAC, which we talked a little bit about before. Um, it'll acquire the tucked file. Your, if you have uh, something actually underneath a track file underneath the uh, cursor, it'll grab that guy or it'll grab the acquisition point queue. Uh, if there's no tucked file, and then uh, you can also get into it through uh, air combat uh, maneuvering modes. And then track wall scan, we'll actually cover that one next. Uh, so track wall scan, or sometimes jokingly as people refer to it as track wall lie, is used to scan a concentrated volume of airspace uh, for multi-target engagement. It's the primary reason that kind of exists. So TWS automatically restricts that radar scan volume uh, to optimize the track wall update rate in support of you know, the potential of launching AMRAI missiles or anything that needs command guidance. Uh, so that scan limited or scan volume is limited uh, by bar settings. So in two bar, you're going to have a uh, max as myth scan of 80 uh, degrees, four bar is 40, and six bar is 20. Uh, so it displays both MSI tracks up to 10 again, and radar contact information as, after it's exhausted the 10 tracks. Um, you have multiple scan centering modes, and these were the actual, at least from my experience, these are the ones that tripped me up when I first started using TWS. Because TWS is great. You can launch on multiple targets at the same time uh, with what Tex was saying about switching, swapping between LNS and DT2, but you have to be able to support both of those targets, uh, you know, while you're supporting, the, you know, excuse me, support both those missiles while they're in the air until they go active. Uh, so the way you can do that is you can manually uh, basically move the scan volume. So wherever your TDC, and this is kind of the default value, so whatever your TDC is at an az or azimuth on your radar attack page is where the scan will be centered. So if you're at a six bar, uh, 20 degree scan, and you move it directly into the middle of the screen, it will scan to the right uh, 10 degrees and to the left 10 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can also bias. So if you depress the TDC over empty space, you can force the scan center to be about that location. So if it's to the right 20 degrees or whatever, you can set your scan centering over there. You can also do that on the as and L uh, screen too. And then auto is pretty awesome. So basically, if you have an LNS target and you switch to auto, the radar will scan center azimuth and elevation on that LNS target. So you don't have to do anything else. But kind of the one of the downside risks of setting auto is if you lose that track file for any reason, you're stuck in auto and you need to go back to manual, at least as of my testing two weeks ago. So you won't have any control over your elevation, was at least that's what I found. So you need to go back into manual to you know basically search for targets again. Otherwise, you're only going to see what's actually in your current scan volume that's being controlled by auto, probably by old information. So scan centering modes, definitely play around with those. It's, uh, you know, I had to try it a couple of times before I got used to it. Uh, and then there's two, LNS or TWS offers uh, two other modes. Uh, one of them is expand. It's really just a display thing. Uh, so basically, if you press the expand button, it'll zoom in and center on those on the tactical display on your LNS target. This is great if you if there's a bunch of targets like kind of closely grouped together and you really you know so when we're talking about sorting targets, you're sorted to the left and you want to grab that leftmost target. 
if you can't make them out on the regular setting, you know, like just on the regular attack page, you try to expand and see if you can grab that left guy. Chances are you can um, in in zoom, you know, in expand mode. Scan rate is something completely different per the radar. Basically, what it does is it commands like a special mode, and really what it's doing is just like intense Doppler resolution scan. And this is useful when you think you have multiple targets at that are really close and range and bearing. Maybe they're flying in formation, so maybe the range difference is in like you know whatever uh, parade formation is, and bearing difference is negligible, and they're roughly at the same speed. Scan rate basically commands this 22 degree azimuth three bar scan centered around the LNS that tries to detect additional targets that weren't previously found um, just through simple. Doppler, you know, through the regular Doppler filter bank. So this actually looks like it it helps you like resolve targets that are closely spaced in Doppler. Um, and then uh, it'll automatically switch to SCT if you fire an AIM-7 if it's launched. So you can still be in TWS and fire AIM-7s. It'll just go to STT for you on your LNS. Any questions? Yeah, that, that, that scan and raid is super helpful if you, like, if a lot of times there'll be a two ship coming at you and they'll be in, you know, relatively tight formation and you'll be able to tell that it's two different track files on your radar screen, but your TDC can't separate them out to, to designate both targets. So at that point you can, uh, I tend to have better luck with the expand versus the raid, but you can definitely try both of them um, to try to split those targets out to where you can, uh, you know, designate a second a DT2 there. Right. So yeah, expand is definitely the one I go for first um, because it doesn't actually change any of my settings. But if you go into scan raid, if you still can't resolve targets and you go into scan raid, it you know does that special Doppler processing. And you can actually do that with the radar or excuse me, the field of view raid button on your controller. Uh, so it is HOTAS bound, whereas the expand, you have to actually press the, the on screen button which is down here on the on the very bottom uh, left hand side, uh, and then you can actually press the raid scan mode too up here, but it's uh, Hotas bound if you you know if you have that bound, and then scan centering mode is down here or down here in the the middle on the right. Uh, so this target I actually have an auto, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I think that's it for radar modes. The next section is air to air weapons, which we'll cover in the next brief. Sweet, so, thanks, Fajita. Sure. Yeah, sorry. I uh uh I do have to I should probably told you this at the beginning, but I'm a technical guy, I'm terrible at presentations. I, so <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. That's, and you guys are all guinea pigs. I I think uh just a few guys have actually seen this brief uh so far, so it actually hasn't really been peer reviewed that much. I will need your uh I will need your help because uh of all the Dozens of sessions that I've uh, OBSed. This one uh, crashed the audio, the video. So I've got all of the audio recorded, and uh, I've got about twenty minutes of single slide being displayed for, oh, for, really? the, for the first gotcha. half of the session. So um, I'll, I'll bounce that through you, and uh, and we'll just uh, flick through the slides uh, if I can't yeah. if I can't follow what you're saying and pick the slides and overlay them. Yeah, no problem. And then uh, text. I think this is Reb B. I made some like really minor modifications since the last time I sent it to you. So after I send you this version too. Okay. Yeah. Send that to me, and I'll get that uploaded into our training folder. Cool. But are there any any questions? Did I go too fast? I was kind of worried that I might have gone a little too fast because I get nervous and I talk fast. No, that was kick ass. Uh, you were getting moist talking about NTTR, so it was it was really good. To see you into your subject matter that was great so you guys should totally look that up especially like jet engine modulation there's some fascinating shit out there on jet engine modulation it really is the uh cool thing for me like going through it to think and i i had to keep reminding myself this is a directional radar because i'm used to like with what i got 
our uh, our Dasser 11s. Uh, granted, we have satellites, we have long range radars, we have everything. But if all that fancy shit goes out, we're stuck with a 360 degree, 60 mile only radar. So to see what we put in the military's hands and aircraft it being directional uh, is very freaking impressive. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. I mean, you can get yourself into trouble by setting these crazy scan volumes and like I mean, during testing, like I had trouble building track files if I left it at the default 140, you know, as and you know, uh, you know, four bar scan. Like I would, I may or may not build a track file at 80 miles. Yeah, yeah, very difficult to do that at 80 miles. Almost can't see so, anything. So one other thing to to keep in mind if you if you've never seen the nose cone off of a jet, there is physically a radar dish in there that's motorized that moves around inside of that, you know, nose cone. So if you think of, you know, your radar's pointing 70 degrees off to the left, then that dish inside of the nose cone is literally pointed 70 degrees off to the left. So um, it's always kind of cool to see those pictures and, you know, imagine that thing sweeping back and forth and up and down, you know, while the jet's flying. That's a great point because I think when we get into tactical engagements and like the F pull and notching and stuff, we'll talk about, you know, like flying to gimbal limits. Yep. And yeah, there's definitely some limitations there. I think the new AESA radars are electronically steered. They, you know, steer the beam electronically. So there's actually no moving parts, but nice. yeah, it's pretty wild. So uh, before we do BFM, I wanted to go over this little cheat sheet I made for the ACM modes. Um, this is, uh, this was helpful for me putting it together because I couldn't remember some of these ranges and stuff. Uh, so you've got several modes you can get into um, via your sensor select switch on the stick. So um, you got to kind of be careful of the range here because if you get into one of these and your target's you know more than this range out, then you're not going to be able to lock them up until they get in there. So it's really best to kind of hold off going into one of these modes until you know they're within the range. Uh, so the gun acquisition mode, uh, you'll see GACQ on the uh, on the HUD. Uh, Anytime you select the air-to-air guns and you don't have a target locked, it's going to just automatically go into that mode. Uh, You'll get a large dotted circle around the HUD. And if you get a target inside of that circle within five miles, it's going to lock it up. Um, Bore sight, I use a ton. Uh, Basically, the way you're going to get in there is the the helmet's got to be off. And then you're just going to do your sensor select forward. At that point, you're going to get a small dotted circle in the HUD. And it will automatically lock anything within that dotted circle if it's within 10 miles. So, uh, you know, if you know you've got somebody right on your nose and, and, you know, they get down in that 10 miles, a lot of times it's easy just to sensor select forward, you know, put them, put them in that circle and you'll get a lock that way. Uh, vertical acquisition mode uh, is VACQ. Uh, and, and really all these sub modes down here, you've got to be in, in one of these ACM modes. So basically you've got a sensor select forward. Uh, to get into it because that's basically what's going to to get you into the acm modes is forward and then after that you could do some of these other uh, buttons uh, so if you go forward into bore sight and then aft that puts you in vertical acquisition mode what that's going to do is it's going to put two uh you know horizontal or vertical dashed lines on your hud and basically the the uh radar is going to search in between those dotted lines so this is really good if you're in a turn fight and you lost lock and you know you're about co-altitude, then you can just, you know, put that, uh, those, bo- those dotted lines parallel with the horizon pull. And then as soon as you get into one, um, it, it'll lock it up. And the good thing is it's, it's uh, negative 13 degrees and plus 46 degrees. So it's actually going to scan if you're, pu- if you're locked, banked over, uh, you know, 90 degrees and pulling, it's going to be scanning 46 degrees out in front of you. Uh, but the, the limitation here is you drop down to only five nautical miles worth of range. If you go sensor select left, it puts you in wide acquisition mode, which will be WACQ. Uh, this, uh, this is a roll stabilized uh, 60 degree azimuth uh, relative to the water line of the jet. So it's a plus six degrees and minus nine. So it's basically a narrow uh, rectangle. You'll actually see a rectangle in the HUD to let you know you're in that mode. And then since it is roll stabilized, then that rectangle in the HUD will stay roll stabilized as well. So if you do pull vertical and start pulling, then, you know, that's still going to be searching, uh, 
you know, relative to, to the water line of the jet there. So I don't use this a whole lot, but it is something that, it, you know, I, I could see it being uh, beneficial because it does go out to that 10 miles. So a lot of times if you're just having problems, lock it, you know, they're about co altitude and, uh, you know, if they're between five and 10 miles is probably the best time to use this because it is going to stay, uh, you know, roll stabilized. A uh, helmet acquisition is, um, well, basically if the helmet is on and you do sensor select forward, and it's going to put you in the, the helmet acquisition mode. And basically at that point, you're going to get that small dotted circle in the helmet view. And then you can lock anything uh, in it to within 10 miles. And you've got to be a little bit careful here. If you've got the helmet on and you try to, like if you're in one of these other modes, you try to go to bore sight. You know, if the helmet's on and you go sensor select forward, you're not going to be in bore sight. You're going to be in the helmet mode. So you've got to, if you're, you got to make sure that your helmet is pointed directly in your HUD if you're trying to use that dot that's, or that circle that's in the HUD. Uh, another mode is the long range helmet acquisition. And this is going to be the same sensor select forward. You're just going to hold it. I think it's like 0.8 seconds. You've got to hold it uh, to get into that mode. And the cool thing here is that will lock a target out to 40 miles. So uh, it could be helpful if, if you know, you know, if, if you've got the, the data link, uh, in the helmet, you can tell there's a contact out there. You want to lock it up. Can't find it in your radar. A lot of times you can go into that uh, helmet acquisition mode and, and get them that way. And then we talked a little bit about um, auto acquisition earlier. Um, if you're in, if you're not in one of these ACM modes and you do sensor select right. Um, and and uh, so some other caveats, your radar has to be selected as the, the sensor of interest. So you've got the little diamond in the top right corner of the radar attack screen. You're in air to air mode and you do not have an ACM mode selected. If you do sensor select ride, it's going to go into this auto acquisition. And like Fajita was talking about, whatever that main primary track file is, it's just going to lock it up. So I, I think this might be what gets some buddy locks happening when when we don't really know what's going on. So uh, just kind of be on the lookout for that AAQ, that auto acquisition. Um, I, I don't ever use it. Do any of you guys ever use that mode? I only started looking at it when you when you did this uh, this uh, yeah. trip sheet. So, so every time I've tried to use it, I just end up locking people that I don't want to lock. Yep. Um, so if you, if you end up in this, if you see the AAQ um, on the radar attack page in the top left corner, uh, you can just do sensor select aft and it'll get you out of that. And then you'll be back in the normal BVR modes. Um, so, and this is just basically just kind of the a shortcut view, quick down and dirty of what Fajita went over today. So um, if you're not familiar with these, uh, this would be a great thing to throw in your kneeboard file. And I, I mean, obviously in the middle of a dogfight, you can't pull this up and look at it, but um, it, you know, if, if you, if you need to look at it, you know, while you're, you know, just flying or getting, into an area or you forgot exactly how to get into one of these modes, then then it'll be helpful to have that in there. Just wanted to add that uh, because people will miss it. Um, at the very top of this sheet, there's a very important piece, which is enter by pressing sensor select forward. So none of these left, aft, and so on will work until you go to helmet or bore sight. And, and equally, the uh, AZ uh, azimuth elevation page will not engage if you're in these as well. So, if you if what you want to do is to be in BVR mode, want to switch your azimuth elevation, you you can't be in any of those close range modes. And and this here too, this gets me sometimes because you'll you'll get in a dogfight and you'll shoot somebody down, and then you need to go back to scanning further out, and then you can't get it out of whatever mode you're in here. So. Um, Sometimes the undesignate works, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, you all you want to hit the RTS, uh, return to search OSB on the radar page. It's typically the top left where you would switch between uh, RWS or TWS. But if you're in one of these modes, that actually switches to RTS and will kind of get you out of these and, and back into a normal uh, radar scan mode. So uh, that that's tripped me up a bunch of times. Yeah, especially in WIDAC where you just automatically reacquire the guy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I think we got server one up with our BFM mission.